Well, I want to speak to you more broadly first. We're seeing an unprecedented demand on networks, on the cloud, on services that Microsoft offers with uh, so many people working and schooling their children remotely. What's it been like for you behind the scenes, making sure uh, you can keep the lights on? Have there been any close calls with the networks under so much pressure? So far, everything's been holding up really well, but it is an uh, unusual time in and that we're seeing so much growth coming all at once in uh, some of our core collaboration and communication products that we're building. Uh, Microsoft has a number of efforts ongoing in healthcare, uh, and you oversee a lot of that. How can some of these efforts help in the fight against COVID-19? Well, one of the things that we've been super fortunate uh, is to have good partnerships with biotech companies in place. So we, uh, we, we've we done some very interesting work and are doing interesting work with a company called Adaptive Biotechnologies, uh, where we've been working to build up a mapping of the uh, immune system and diseases. Uh, so we, we've already worked with Adaptive to use AI and machine learning to uh, hopefully bring uh, a test to market that will uh, determine whether or not there are COVID-19 antibodies in a sample of blood, which will help us better map out the progression of the virus in the population. Uh, we're also doing some really interesting stuff right now using some of the same supercomputing capacity that we have been previously using for training deep neural networks for natural language processing to run molecular simulations to try to identify potential therapies for uh, COVID-19 um, by better understanding the structure of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Now, time seems to be the most precious resource right now. I mean, how quickly can some of these, uh, you know, actually start working? You know, how quickly will we see the results of some of these very exciting technologies, um, you know, the, the problem is we need them now. Yeah, and, and I think everybody feels an incredible sense of urgency at the moment. So the, the encouraging thing is that I don't think we have ever seen as many scientists and doctors come together with their partners in the computing sciences as quickly as we have over the past few weeks to try to figure out how we can all work together to develop therapies and potential vaccines for this terrible disease. Um, so like we, we have a huge number of, of candidate therapies and, and potential vaccines coming to uh, trial shortly, but it's very hard, I think, to say, uh, you know, what the timeline might be for when these things are available for use safely uh, with humans. Now, your new book looks at how rural America is falling behind when it comes to things like broadband, things like educational opportunities. And I'm curious, do you think we come out of this pandemic more or less divided, given, given that uh, there is a digital divide in America and, and some folks are going to be left behind? I hope we will choose this is an opportunity to focus on building some of the critical infrastructure that we all need to have a fully inclusive digital future for everyone. So one of the things that you know you, you just mentioned is broadband uh, connectivity and it's sort of an acute issue right now as more work is uh, moving to uh, work from home scenarios and as uh, kids are doing some of their schooling from, from home. So if you don't have an internet connection, uh, you, you can't work and you can't, uh, you can't have your kids go to school, which is uh, just a really, really terrible thing. And, and we have, you know, even though it shouldn't be this way, we have 25 million people in the United States who have inadequate access to broadband connectivity, 19 million of those people in rural parts of the country. So I, what I'm hoping that we do on the other side of this is not just have a surge of investment in the biosciences and biotechnology uh, and in AI in a way that will help us uh, have cheap, high quality, ubiquitous healthcare in the future, but we'll also address some of these basic issues like broadband connectivity that really need to get sorted out before we can have a fully inclusive digital future for everyone. 
Now, you go back to your hometown in rural Virginia, you know, a place where, like many places in the United States, you've got workers who live in fear that artificial intelligence is going to take their jobs or, or make their jobs obsolete. Uh, should they be scared of AI? I don't think they should. I mean, in fact, when I, when I went back home as I started writing this book, what you just said was exactly what I was expecting to find. And what, what I found instead were a group of people who already were incorporating fairly advanced technology in their businesses to be competitive in a global marketplace. Um, and, and it was just sort of striking to, to see how inventive and ingenious folks were being at using the best tools that they could possibly get their hands on to create success and opportunity for themselves and their communities. I, I think when you think about AI, it is a tool it's an unusually powerful tool, perhaps the most powerful one that human beings have ever invented. But there's no reason whatsoever to believe that folks in these rural communities and in middle America won't be able to pick these tools up and to use them to create prosperity.